Probably got to college, maybe even in the professional football league, that I realized that my childhood was kind of different than a lot of people's. Glenville, Georgia is not much more than a dot on the map. Its downtown boasts two traffic lights, and most of its 3,600 residents are from local farming families who work their own land and profess their faith in the Southern Holy Trinity of church, family, and community. If outsiders know Glenville at all, it's for the sweet Vidalia onions that can only grow in this red Georgia soil. But the locals are proud to live in a community that has been a cradle of NFL greatness. For Glenville is the hometown of not just one, but two of pro football's elite, Shannon and Sterling Sharp. My aunt's room. Uh, Gladys, Jane, Jane Sheridan, Marinell. Four girls slept in this room. This was my sister and my nephew's room right here. And this was the living room. There's the living room right here. We used to have a, uh, a telephone pole, I mean a uh, TV pole, that you had to come out and turn so you could get the service. You know, you come out, right there, right there, right there. It was the norm for us, so it wasn't out of the ordinary, you know, because we didn't go to our friends' houses and we didn't know, hey, we have a bathtub and we do this. The norm for us was going to the well and getting water. The norm for us was when you had to go use the bathroom, you found the place in the woods. That was the norm for us. So I, I would love to sit here and tell you how tragic it was, but it really wasn't. It was the norm for us. And it was definitely motivation, though, once we got older, that the one thing, the only thing I ever wanted was to live in a house with running water. Hey, do me a favor, because America, they may not understand. If you want to see the bathroom here for this house, just pan to your right. All that out there, there's your restroom. I remember, you know, we stand in front of the fireplace and, you know, run in the back room and, and get in the bed and, and get up under the covers. Go into school with, you know, smut on the back of your pants because you stood too close to the fireplace because it was really, really cold. Um, you know, there's no paneling in the house. There's no insulation in the house. It was basically cinder blocks, cement floors. And so it was really, really cold in the winter and it was really, really hot in the summer. My grandfather, my grandmother, she and I slept in this room. Mary Porter was a no-nonsense lady who raised nine children and three grandchildren in this 1,000-square-foot house. At times, up to a dozen family members lived in this cinder block structure with a cement floor, no running water, no indoor plumbing, all heated by a tiny fireplace. For most of us uh, in the 80s and 90s, you don't think that exists, but it did. and. Uh, it motivated them. It's not by accident that two guys from Glenville, Georgia made it to the NFL. That ain't by accident. But it's definitely not by design either. We had what we needed. We didn't ask for anything, didn't ask for a whole lot. And I think it made us determined. In addition to farming, Granny supplemented the family income working as a housekeeper. She worked at the Glenview Nursing Home from, I think her shift was from seven to three. Uh, she made $197 every two weeks, and how do I know? Because I looked at a paycheck one uh, once, and, uh, and how she was able to keep my sister, my brother, myself, my four aunts, how we were able to survive off that, you know. You know, sometimes you had to go, you, my grandmother had to make tough decisions. Is it going to be the lights or is it going to be the gas this month? All the adults in Shannon's life worked from morning to night for low pay. Shannon found himself frustrated by the way poverty robbed his grandparents of control. I remember my grandmother telling a story about how they used to have to wash the clothes for the people that property they lived on Monday through Saturday. And on Sunday, they want to go to church. So they'd go to church and come back home and the people would bring load of clothes over and she's like it's Sunday and we just got back from church and the people would tell them say well Lou if you don't wash these clothes you're gonna have to move on and it just broke my heart granny's financial anxiety was like a hammer pounding in Shannon's head it became a constant rhythm that drove him forward 
I remember if you know you had a cut, you couldn't go to the doctor, and you know you might need five, ten stitches, but you weren't going to the doctor. If you had a toothache, my grandfather just pulled it. It was no dentist. I just knew that there was something outside of Glenville, and I had to get to it. Growing up poor in Glenville, Georgia, working the land was a requirement, not an option for both Shannon and Sterling. Now this entire field used to be tobacco. was tobacco. Small as I was, I was six or seven years old, and I would carry what we call a rope, a row of tobacco. I was responsible for this rope. Crop tobacco, we take this row all the way down. You work cropping tobacco seven to five, six in the afternoon, and then we would go catch chickens at night. So you caught a thousand chickens, you got one dollar. So we make it maybe 12 bucks cropping tobacco from seven to six, and then you made 16 bucks for catching chickens four nights a week. Then we come home, get four or five hours of sleep, and we go right back to the fields the next morning. During the school year, we did the same thing. So I had to walk from right here two miles to the end of the road to get picked up to school. That's where the bus dropped me off to walk back home after school. It didn't matter. It wasn't, oh, it's raining today. The bus is going to come down here and pick me up. No. Nope. I was going to walk down there, and I was going to wait for the bus to come, and I was going to get on the bus, and I was going to go to school. My grandmother used to always tell my brother and I that all the hard labor and things that we had to do, it takes all that to make a man. The boys quickly figured out that playing sports was the easiest way to get out of working in the fields. As always, Sterling led the way, signing up at age nine to play football. His impact was immediate. We were playing in a all-star football game with Sterling one year. He was 10 and 11 and running over 12 and 13 year olds the way he did. I mean, it was nothing for him to touch the ball five times, have four touchdowns. This was a young age. You know, and I don't care if it is rec football. When you touch the ball five times and you score four touchdowns, you're pretty special. Someone else who recognized Sterling's special talents early on was Coach William Hall a man who would become a steady influence in the boys' lives. He saw enough promise in Sterling to bring him up to the JV high school team when he was still in middle school. One of his uh, former teammates down there told me about him, uh, you know, how good he was and how fast he was, and told me to go down there and check him out. And surely I went down and asked him about playing football on his junior varsity team. He smiled and said, okay. The first time I ever touched the football, in competition, first game I ever played, what happened? You ran it back for a touchdown. I, I held the ball up right. and celebrated. Right. Had to re-kick it, what happened then? The official came over to explain to me what happened. I said, first of all, you said taunting and so forth. I said, with nobody within 50 yards, how can you taunt somebody <laughs> if they're not that close? He said, well, we're going to have to redo it. I said, okay, you just going to have to run 15 yards further. Sure enough, that's what happened. Football opened a new world to Sterling but other changes were coming too. His grandfather, Barney Porter, died of a heart attack. This loss left Granny as the family matriarch and young Sterling as the man of the house. My grandfather died, I was in the seventh grade. All of a sudden, now he's not here. There's no male role model in my house. My brother kind of felt more of a sense of obligation and a duty that the dominant male figure in our family was gone now. And it was his job to be the protector, to make sure I did what I was supposed to do. I became the man I was supposed to become. The term father figure, my brother will tell you that I provided that for him, but I'm not his father. A lot of times I think he thought I was, and a lot of people think I am, but I'm not his father. Well, he kind of was. Um, I followed him everywhere. I wanted to be just like my brother. My sister used to always tell me, stop trying to be like him. Be your own person. But he was the person that I wanted to be. 